Good evening, <clears throat> Your Excellencies, distinguished members of parliament, lieber Herr Präsident Ziegler, dear colleagues, dear students, dear guests, I would like to welcome you to tonight's public event dedicated to the proposal for the creation of a special tribunal for the prosecution of the crime of aggression against Ukraine. My name is Helmut Aust and I'm a professor of public and international law here at Freie Universität, as well as an associate fellow of the German Council on Foreign Relations. While I will introduce the evening with a few substantive remarks, as well as an introduction of our distinguished guests here on the panel in a moment, I would first like to call on Professor Günther Ziegler, the president of Freie Universität Berlin, who would like to open the evening with some remarks. Mr. President, dear Professor Ziegler, it is wonderful that you honor this event with your presence. The floor is yours. Lieber Herr Kollege Aust, uh, it is indeed a special honor and pleasure to open this event. Ladies and gentlemen, dear Mr. Smirnov, who is with us on Webex, dear Mr. Konjevich, dear Mrs. Menzelva, hope I get the names somewhere right, <laughs> uh, dear Mrs. Drick, uh, dear Professor Tomoshat, Dear guests, uh, ladies and gentlemen, it is a great pleasure and honor for me to welcome you, all of you, but in particular also this delegation here tonight at the Henry Ford Building of Freie Universität Berlin. I've heard that this event is part of a bigger trip of the Ukrainian delegation across Europe and also to the United States, with stops at the Bundestag and the Federal Foreign Office earlier today. So we are honored that we can also host you here this evening. One year ago, I would not have imagined a discussion with such a title taking place at our university. Most people in Western Europe, I guess, including politicians, diplomats, and academics, did not expect Russia to really invade Ukraine at such a scale. For more than nine months now, Vladimir Putin is leading an intensified and extended war against Ukraine, a war that had really been going on already since 2014. I think that's also part of the truth, which is sometimes skipped. Today, we could ask the questions, why didn't we see this coming? And why didn't we prepare better? Didn't we care enough? Or was this non-expectation part of our rational assumption that Putin would not make the mistake to really invade Ukraine at such a scale? A mistake that I guess is today more obvious than ever before. Indeed, most of us didn't expect and we didn't prepare accordingly. However, the answer of Europe and the bigger part of the international community to the Russian aggression is clear and I think it's impressive. Solidarity with Ukraine is enormous across the continent, ranging from governmental support to a massive commitment of individuals in our societies. Also, we as Freie Universität have been speaking out loudly against the war and have been welcoming refugee students, academics, and administrators. That way, we have until today been able to make our university a new home institution for many people fleeing Russian politics and aggression. Freie Universität Berlin bears three founding principles in its logo, Libertas, Veritas, and Justitia. In Latin, liberty, truth, and justice. And indeed, these three values are connected. As Disraeli, former British Prime Minister in the 19th century, has observed, 
Justice is truth in action that connects two of them, justice and truth. And yes, we are the Freie Universität Berlin, and this Freie, free, does not mean no tuition, but it means free, and it meant free when in 1948 this university was founded in West Berlin. Tomorrow we will be celebrating our 74th birthday. At that time, Freie Universität in West Berlin was set up as a counter model to Stalinist suppression that at the time strangled the old traditional university, which was located in what was then the Soviet part of the city. In that sense, I believe there's no better place than Freie Universität for this kind of discussion about establishing a special tribunal for the punishment of the crime of aggression against Ukraine. That is a big task and a multi-layered project. Its justification and its form will need the support of science. As we all know, the Russian war will not be over tomorrow or next week. Although, of course, I'd be happy if there was a good way to have that. It will demand a lot from the country and its society, especially in the next months. However, it is great to see that the Ukrainian government involves NGOs, think tanks, international organizations, academia, and civil actors into this process. This pluralism and big range of competences is what finally can make that project take off. The will for democracy, empowerment and justice is also what will make Ukraine finally superior over its adversaries. Freie, Berlin, Berlin, uh, Freie Universität Berlin is ready to contribute to this as much as possible. Thank you very much to all of you here and in the web and on the podium for joining us tonight, and I wish you a fruitful discussion. Thank you, Mr. President, for these warm words of welcome. They are much appreciated. It was in this city that the International Military Tribunal, the IMT, opened its proceedings against the leading Nazi war criminals on the 18th of October, 1945. The opening of the trial took place symbolically in the very room in which the infamous Volksgerichtshof under the presidency of Roland Freisler was hearing its cases and in which this Nazi court made a travesty of justice. The first session of the IMT was opened by its president, the Soviet judge, General Nikichenko. The opening of the trial was the first step towards the judgment of the IMT, delivered a good year later in Nuremberg. And in this judgment, it was famously recorded, crimes are committed by men, not abstract entities. The Nuremberg trial is often identified as the birth moment of modern international criminal law. It stands for the idea that international law is not just a law among nations, but that individuals like us assembled in this room must also respect the most important rules and commands of international law. Yet, the legacy of Nuremberg is more uncertain than it is often acknowledged. The development of international criminal law since the Nuremberg and Tokyo trials has been patchy. After a long hiatus in the Cold War, it was only with the creation of the ad hoc tribunals for the former Yugoslavia and Rwanda by the UN Security Council in the 1990s that the idea of prosecuting individuals for core crimes gained traction again. The ad hoc tribunals paved the way for the creation of the International Criminal Court in 1998 by the Rome Statute um, and part of the idea behind the establishment of the ICC was the idea to move away from ad hoc tribunals and to provide for a permanent and truly universal international criminal court. 
To date, its universal aspiration remains unfulfilled. The ICC has 123 state parties. However, many states are not among them, and the list of non-state parties includes both Ukraine and the Russian Federation. Still, the ICC has jurisdiction to prosecute the crimes of genocide, crimes against humanity, and war crimes which are being committed on the Ukrainian territory due to declarations that Ukraine has registered with the ICC in 2014. Yet, what the ICC cannot do in the case of the current war is to prosecute the crime of aggression. And we will hear more about the very complicated reasons for this, um, for this situation. With its invasion of Ukraine on the 24th of February this year, the Russian Federation has continued and further aggravated its illegal use of force against Ukraine, which it had already started in 2014. In order to fill the accountability gap for aggression, various proposals have been made to create a special tribunal for the prosecution of this crime. We assemble here today to learn more about the ideas behind these plans, different models, how they could be operationalized, but also to discuss some critical aspects which need to be pondered before such a special tribunal can be set in motion. While the idea for such a tribunal has been discussed for quite some time, it is in this very week um, that new political momentum has developed, uh, in particular with the backing of the EU Commission's president, Ursula von der Leyen, for the idea. Creating such a special tribunal for the prosecution of the crime of aggression would mark a considerable step for the further development of international criminal law. At the same time, and we must also discuss that, legal, practical, and political challenges remain. From a legal perspective, the issue of personal and functional immunities of high-ranking Russian state officials is far from being settled. Practically, a special tribunal would need to get hold of suspects in order to conduct trials which respect core notions of the rule of law. And politically, some commentators have identified double standards criticizing that influential Western states have not been faced with the creation of a special tribunal for aggression when they conducted wars of aggression, as it was the case of the US and UK-led invasion of Iraq in 2003. I hope that we will have a chance to engage in a nuanced and constructive debate on these issues today, guided by what I believe is a widely shared sentiment that Russia and its leaders must be held responsible for the grave violations of international law that the Russian war of aggression has brought upon Ukraine. Upholding the international rule of law requires mechanisms which are themselves in accordance with international law. An event like ours tonight is, I believe, of vital importance for a free, critical, and constructive discussion towards the creation of such mechanisms. At the outset, and before it is too late, I would like to express my sincere thanks to a number of institutions and people. Mr. Bohan Veselovsky at the Ukrainian delegation uh, to the Parliamentary Assembly at the Council of Europe was the main point of contact for coordinating the event. The event would not have been possible without the support of the Konrad Adenauer Foundation, which sponsors the reception to which we will be invited afterwards. And Mr. Vasil Mikalishin deserves to be mentioned here in this regard. Um, here at Freie Universität Berlin, the president's office was an uh, enthusiastic supporter of the idea right from the start, as well as the Department of Law. And I would like to thank our administrative director, Dr. Christine von den Hoff. But the largest part of the organization here in Berlin was carried out by my secretary, Kerstin Oestrom, who has held all the threads together. So thank you so much to her, to everyone else involved in the organization of the evening. Without further ado, I would like to launch into our discussions and I would like to introduce the extremely distinguished guests on the panel always before they speak, so as not to have me continue with introductions now for 10 minutes. So you will be introduced in turn when you make your addresses and comments. Um, and we will start with two addresses from the office of the president of Ukraine. And the first address is a pre-recorded video message from Mr. Andriy Yermak, the head of the office of the president of Ukraine. And um, I hope that we can now start the video. Dear participants, 
as you know, Germany became a bastion of democracy because it had its Nuremberg. The tribunal condemned Nazi ideology and sentenced those involved in war crimes and crimes against humanity. But the first of all, it punished those who made decisions and gave orders, those who unleashed an aggressive war. Neither the USSR nor Russia had their own Nuremberg. So the Kremlin's imperial ideology remains the leading threat to peace in Europe and in the world. And of course, in no sense, in existential threats to Ukraine, we have to put an end to this. The international community must bring the Russian leadership to criminal responsibility for the crime of aggression against Ukraine. The ongoing war is the largest armed conflict in Europe since World War II. According to the Ukrainian Prosecutor General's Office data, over 46,000 war crimes have been committed so far, and more than 8,000 civilians have perished, Four, uh, 450 children among them, 43,000 houses, and tens of the thousand civil infrastructure objects have been destroyed. 11,000 children have been forcibly deported from Ukraine. They are the facts we know, but the real scale of the tragedy is obviously much greater. The other sides we face are staring. Then our police experts exhumed the mass graves in the Zoom, we found body of the minor girl who was first raped and then brutally murdered. We found the body of the young man who had his genitals cut off before this execution. The see terrible finds like this in nearly every liberated town. Those who commit these crimes must be tried by Ukrainian national courts and the International Criminal Court. But behind this crime, there is a one that has been made then possible. The leadership crime, the crime of people in power, the crime of aggression, and the doubt investigation into and punishment of the guilty, we cannot restore justice. The President of Russia, Vladimir Putin, and the members of the Security Council of Russia, who has initiated the aggression, must get their sentences. However, there is a currently no judicial body that can do this. The International Criminal Court in Haag, which is the investigating Russians' crimes against Ukraine, can pursue for a genocide crimes against humanity and war crimes. However, it is difficult to establish a legal connection between specific war crimes and instruction from the Kremlin. It is hard to prove the uh, guilt of Putin and his cronies. Besides, the ICC does not have sufficient judi judicial uh, powers. And obviously, it will not. Russia will never ratify either the Rome Statute of ICC or the Kampala amendments on the crimes aggression. In the meantime, Russia it is permanent member of the UN Security Council. So this body is unlikely to the official recognize the Russian aggression against Ukraine, which would later allow to refer the, race, the case to the ICC. Since the first days of the all-out invasion on February 24, 
we have been looking for the answer to the questions. How to bring to justice those who initiate aggression against Ukraine? We waited all available mechanism. We consult the, the prominent international lawyers from around the world. We have come to sad conclusion. It is highly likely that no one will be brought to justice for the aggression unless a special international tribunal is established. And the tribunal should focus on the crime of aggression against Ukraine. It can be created by signing an agreement between the states willing to join or based on the agreement between Ukraine and the international body. Those who gave direct orders to start armed aggressions and full-scale invasion of Ukraine must be tried. These are the Russian Security Council members, including the President, the Prime Minister, the Minister of Defense, and Foreign Affairs, senior military leaders, and other high-ranking officials. We ask for the creation of the Special International Tribunal entitled to do it. In our view, it should be based on the open multilateral agreements of all the civilized nation. All the states that are ready to give a legal assessment to the barbaric war policy of Putin and his ruling clique. They understand that this tribunal should be located outside Ukraine. We expect world leaders to delegate competent judges to this tribunal. We really hope that while Ukraine is fighting for uh, its very existence, the international legal doctrine will finally work. Other sides, the civilization will be doomed. It is an issue the wild world should face. If we don't follow these principles, well, are you ready for the power crazed dictator to announce territorial claims for some other country? Are you ready for the new hybrid wars? Are you ready to put up the international blackmail and terror? To witness the new tens of the thousands of deaths? If not, please support the creation of tribunal. Russia deserved its Nuremberg. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, we can now continue with another statement from the uh, Office of the President of Ukraine. We have Mr. Andriy Smirnov, who is the Deputy Head of the Office of the President, who is joining us live from Kiev. Can you hear us? Yes, yes we can. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Um, I understand that you will present your observations in Ukrainian language. Uh, we do not have a simultaneous translation, so I suggest that your interpreter um, proceeds uh, by translating individual passages of your speech to us. Mr. Shazevsky, is that okay with you? Can you also hear us? I'll, I'll be doing it simultaneously because the Ukrainian uh, channel will be muted, so no worries there. Uh, okay, so let's see if this if this works. Then we are ready to start. Uh, dear colleagues and partners, I'm extremely pleased to see each of you and feel your support that you provide every day to Ukraine, a country that fights for its right to exist, not only as a democracy, but also as a country on the map of the civilized world, not in words, but by its actions. And we are fighting for this right in the undeclared aggressive war unleashed by the Russians against Ukraine. The most terrible war is the war for peace. And this war is taking place at the cost of tens of thousands of innocent civilians, women, minors, and young children, tortured, abused, killed at close range or uh, by the Russian missiles. This is a war of light against total darkness in which light will surely win. 
the question is at what cost? Since the first days of escalation on, of the war on February 24, 2022, the legal team of the President's office has been searching for effective legal weapons. The weapon that, uh, for some reason, was hidden from the world far away in the bureaucratic drawers. And this weapon is called responsibility for the crime of aggression, which no, no one has been looking for for more than 70 years, calmly uh, contemplating the acts of terror and aggression in Georgia in 2008, in Chechnya, and later in 2014, in the Ukrainian cr Crimea and Donbass. It is enough to open the old, uh, as the world uh, cupboard in the Father's room and take out the doctrine of international law numerous UN Security Council resolutions of the crime of aggression on the crime of the uh, aggression and international conventions to pull out and reread them to realize that everything that civilized world is looking at today is now the norm of the development of democracies is uh, is not the norm of the development of democracies but the immersion of the world order in the global darkness of madness and fears of rabid dictators. We have carefully studied almost all the world's lessons of bringing to justice for the crime of aggression, the original crime that provokes the commission of all other crimes, including genocide, crimes against humanity and war crimes. We have weighed all the risks of using other international instruments and mechanisms and come to one conclusion, the only known alternative and effective mechanism for bringing to justice for the crime of aggression of Russia, against, of Russia against Ukraine is the establishment of a special international tribunal. And the role of Ukraine in this matter is quite simple. We can be a carrier of the idea and advocate its necessity in the civilized world. But it is you, my dear colleagues, who will create the world history of legal victories over modern aggressors. And it is up to you to decide how hard and how quickly you need to kick these mad people who commit such large scale uh, and audacious aggression in the 21st century. Of course, we believe that the sooner we make the doctrine of international law breathe, the sooner this uh, insidious war will end in victory. All an international criminal, a criminal should be a norm on the world map not a sign of courage. After all, we Ukrainians have proved to everyone that we are able and will fight for the lives of our children and for our country until complete victory. Unfortunately, we would like to use the capabilities of the ICC, but for eight months of the escalation of the war, we have not seen even uh, registered proceedings on the crime of aggression. And this is uh, definitely not the fault of the ICC. We are grateful to the ICC for the tireless work they are doing to document and investigate the crime of genocide, crimes against humanity. But the crime of aggression remains outside the quotation marks. And even if Ukraine quickly ratifies the Rome Statute, we objectively understand that Russia will never do it. And therefore, it will make such an investigation within within the mandate of the ICC impossible. Mr. Szerzewski, you're on mute now, so we can't hear what you're translating. Just... You've, you've heard all the text of the statement. Ah, okay, that was the statement. Okay, so you were faster. Um... <laughs> right. Sorry. Now, we have technical difficulties here. We um, are quick to resolve, but there are some problems. Thank you. No worries. It's... Uh... It's clear that it's a diff difficult situation. Yeah. 
So, Mr. Smirnov, I think you have now finished your address. Thank you very much. We, we heard the translation, and the translation was finished before you were finished. So, uh, that was the reason why there was a bit laughter in the room. Thank you. Thank you so much. If you still hear it for this vivid address, it means a lot to us that you have been able to join us from Kiev under the very difficult circumstances that the Ukrainian capital is currently facing. This brings us to the next part of our program. It is a great pleasure and honor to introduce to you Mr. Anton Kurinevich, Ambassador at Large, um, who holds a PhD degree in international law. Ambassador Korinevich is responsible for coordinating um, the issue of the establishment of a special tribunal on the side of the Ukrainian government. And he is also the agent of Ukraine and the current ICJ proceedings in the allegations of genocide case between Ukraine and the Russian Federation. Ambassador, would you like to speak from the podium or from here? Um, the, floor is, the floor is yours. So. Dear colleagues, distinguished uh, students, uh, it's a big pleasure to be present today with you uh, here in uh, Freie Universität Berlin. And uh, I myself, as an associate professor of uh, Taras Shevchenko National University of Kyiv, uh, do feel some, I would say, professional and personal feelings because I cannot now give my lectures on international humanitarian and international criminal law uh, to such an audience uh, in, a, in a room. I do it via Zoom or Teams online uh, because we are under Russian missiles. And um, it was uh, one, one case when uh, on the morning uh, we were given, we were having a lecture on international humanitarian law and in 10 minutes, Russian missiles hit Kyiv. It was the 10th of October, one of the most uh, grievous uh, attacks uh, by Russian missiles on the city center of Kyiv. I'm, I'm sure you saw it all. Uh, so uh, I think that soon we will be able to give such lectures and, and classes to our students um, in situ, so at place. But uh, just try to imagine um, how our students now are, are having their classes in Ukraine, in particular on, on international law, international relations, and, and, and other things. And uh, Mr. President was talking that the uh, motto of the Freie Universität Berlin is Veritas Justitia Libertas, and the motto of uh, our Kiev University is uh, Utilitas Honor et Gloria. And I think that this Sotiria's honor, honor and Gloria is about actually our Ukrainian people now. So about all our uh, efforts uh, and all our fight with uh, Russian aggression. And of course, we are very grateful for your university, for your hospitality, for Ukrainians. Uh, it, it, it matters a lot, of course. Uh, it's a matter of solidarity. It's a matter of response. It's a matter of, I mean, humanity itself. And uh, of course, it's a big pleasure and honor to be here today together with uh, Professor Tomushev. I mean, uh, I think uh, I, I, it, it's quite an op op uh, situation for me to speak before him, because of course, uh, of course, uh, Professor is a, is a worldwide renowned expert. Um, so to start with, uh, I think that the idea of um, having the special tribunal for the crime of aggression against Ukraine is uh, high on the agenda now in the international community. And uh, with saying this, uh, I'm sure that uh, those who are interested in this topic follow it. Um, I think it is quite obvious for all of us here in this room, and, and Mr. Yermak and Mrs. Smirnow were speaking about this, why we are pursuing this goal. Because we consider that accountability for all the atrocities and all the crimes and all the grave violations of international law shall be comprehensive. We're saying comprehensive accountability or comprehensive accountability system, we mean that there should be no loopholes, no gaps in this accountability. And we really feel from Ukrainian side, from Ukrainian perspective, that if we 
uh, go for investigation of war crimes, crimes against humanity, alleged crime of genocide, which is of course needed and it is done now both by Ukrainian national authorities and by the ICC, we may find ourselves in a situation where there will be indictments and arrest warrants and prosecution only in relation to low-level and mid-level Russian military perpetrators. Uh, frankly speaking, for a Ukrainian who lives uh, 15 minutes from Bucha, uh, it's not easy to prove the linkage of a particular war crime committed in Bucha with direct order from Kremlin. Uh, the investigation, prosecution, establishment of this linkage shall be done, of course, but uh, we do not want to find ourselves in a position that this linkage is really hard to establish. And uh, those who are on top of the tree of this aggression uh, have impunity, as they do since 2014. And we quite often might hear the uh, argument that Ukraine shall use all the existing tools to secure accountability. But this is a very good point. And as a Ukrainian agent in the uh, International Court of Justice, I may be sure in saying to you that Ukraine, since 2014, uses effectively and actively all the possible international tools. We made applications to all the possible international courts and tribunals where we can speak about Russia's or Russian citizens' responsibility for grave crimes and grave violations of international law. We have two interstate cases now in the International Court of Justice. We have 10 interstate applications in the European Court of Human Rights. We used the machinery of International Tribunal for the Law of the Sea. And now we do have two cases within arbitration tribunals uh, which are based on the United Nations Convention of the Law of the Sea. We recognize jurisdiction of the International Criminal Court. We uh, use the, all the private public uh, arbitration uh, opportunities for our companies to sue Russia. So we are using all these tools. There is no need to tell us that we should effectively use existing international tools. But we see that they are not enough. And we are sure that when we say this, we are right. Because since 2014, Russia's attitude, Russia's conduct, Russia's behavior hasn't changed. And I may say this very frankly. For three years, I worked in the city of Kherson. And uh, I mean, I know, I know what Russia's violations and Russian war crimes in particular in that southern region of Ukraine means. Uh, I worked on the issues of uh, Crimea. So we know that this hasn't stopped since 2014. And that is why it brought us to the idea that without responsibility for the crime of aggression, we cannot talk about justice. Uh, several indictments or orders of arrest for Russian majors, colonels, is not justice. This is the element of it. And we do believe that this leadership crime is very important. And in order to satisfy this need for justice, we really need the special tribunal. Because Ukrainian national courts, as we all know, may face some difficulties, in particular, trying the top Russian political leadership. Concerning the International Criminal Court, for Ukraine, work with the International Criminal Court is a top priority. On the daily basis, Ukrainian prosecutors from the Prosecutor General's Office cooperate and coordinate with the Office of the Prosecutor of the ICC. Uh, we have amended national legislation, in particular the Criminal Procedural Code. Uh, now we have a special chapter there on cooperation with the ICC. Um, we are now considering opening the field office of the ICC in Ukraine and the, the consultations on such an agreement are being now taking place. And I think that if we call representatives of the ICC now and ask whether they are happy with the level of co cooperation with Ukraine, th they will say, of course, yes, we are happy. But of course, we understand that ICC cannot uh, take the jurisdiction concerning the crime of aggression in this very particular moment. Because the Russian Federation is not a state party to the Rome Statute and to compile amendments to it. And the Russian Federation, of course, will veto any kind of a, a Ukrainian initiative to move with a draft resolution of the United Nations Security Council 
with uh, the idea to refer the situation to the ICC. So whereas ICC is important for three categories of international crimes, war crimes, crimes against humanity, and the crime of genocide, we consider that only the crime, uh, the special tribunal for the crime of aggression can deal with uh, the crime of aggression and with the leadership element of the Russian Federation. Now, as of now, the idea and the concept of establishment the special tribunal has gathered a wide range of support, in particular political support. Uh, there are already four resolutions of Parliamentary Assembly of the Council of Europe, four resolutions of the um, European Parliament, two resolutions of Parliamentary Assembly of NATO, resolution of Parliamentary Assembly of OSCE, resolutions of national parliaments of Ukraine, Lithuania, Estonia, Netherlands, and yesterday France, which say that tribunal for these reasons shall be established. Uh, we also have a very strong now position voiced by the leaders of the European Union. President von der Leyen, today um, His Excellency uh, High Representative uh, uh, Joseph Borrell sounded this several times on the Ministerial Council of OEC in Lodz in particular, on the side event at the ministerial level which took place today at 3 o'clock. Uh, and a lot of ministers of foreign affairs of, of, of the countries uh, uh, were, were present there. I think that many of you noticed a very important statement from French Foreign Ministry published yesterday. So all in all, we are now on the track of moving from political support, political discussion, expert discussion, to finding legal and technical solutions how to do that, how to establish a special tribunal. And of course, for that, we have several options, several models, because of course, there may, may be no universal uh, approach or universal suggestion how to do that. We can use the United Nations uh, as a basis for moving further with this idea. Either the UN General Assembly endorses some kind of establishment of the tribunal or General Assembly gives uh, the instruction to the Secretariat, to the Secretary General to enter into agreement with Ukraine on this matter. This may be agreement of Ukraine with European regional organizations. This can be something which is uh, President von der Leyen called yesterday specialized court for establishment of this responsibility for the crime of aggression. Uh, our position now is very open and we are looking and discovering all the options. Uh, we are really now trying to see the feedback position, positions from our partners in order to find out how do we move forward. But what we are sure about is that the crime of aggression is the mother crime of all the crimes. It, is, it contains within itself the accumulated evil of the whole. So with saying this, if in the situation of the Russian aggression against Ukraine, the crime of aggression is left without response, if it is neglected, in this particular situation, with having all this international recognition of the act of aggression of Russia against Ukraine, in particular by the resolution of UN General Assembly, then maybe the crime of aggression does not exist in international law. And it may be only the source for our university academic expert analysis and writing PhD thesis or reading textbook on public international law. I, as an international lawyer, would like not to have such a situation. And I think that for the concept of the crime of aggression itself, it is very important that it is investigated and prosecuted with international uh, support, with international cooperation, with international elements now. Uh, and to end up, I would just say that while we are moving forward with this idea to have the special tribunal established, we are not looking for universal solutions. We are saying that we need a special tribunal which will be an ad hoc based tribunal only for the situation of the Russian aggression against Ukraine. We do support ICC. We will be happy if the ICC can make its jurisdiction concerning the crime of aggression stronger and if the jurisdiction of the ICC concerning the crime of aggression will be the same as for the war crimes, crimes against humanity, crimes of genocide. But in this particular situation, which must have legal response from international community, we do understand that the establishment of a new mechanism is the only possible way. And the question is not if, the question is how, 
And I'm sure that having political will of our partners, lawyers will find solutions. I thank you. Thank you so much, Ambassador, um, for this presentation of the idea behind the special tribunal. We now turn to the next speech by Ms. Maria Mezenseva, a member of the Ukrainian parliament, and also the head of the permanent delegation of Ukraine to the parliamentary assembly of the Council of Europe. Ms. Mezenseva, the floor is yours. Thank you, Vielen uh, Dank. Friends, I'm taking my phone to be precise with five minutes speech time, and I'll try. Um, you know, I think it's one of the most prominent events in our tour, which has started yesterday in Paris. But I want to trace you back, actually, to the 24th of February, when at 7 a.m. in the Parliament we were voting on the state of emergency law after the uh, full-scale aggression occurred earlier at uh, around 5 a.m. time. You know, and sitting in the parliament, I was thinking, what can I do uh, firstly as a Ukrainian and secondly and foremostly as a parliamentarian, as a person chairing a delegation in a Council of Europe, which was set up 74 years ago, same time as this beautiful Frey University, which will celebrate its birthday soon. And my mission was one, and I shared this idea with colleagues, I said, uh, to nine members of parliament who were ladies, because only ladies could travel at the early stages of the full-scale invasion abroad. I said, ladies, back, and we're going to move uh, through the border, whichever means it would take, because the flights were not operating already, to Strasbourg to kick out Russia from the Council of Europe. And I've been called a little bit loco in Spanish, crazy in English, and uh, um, in Ukrainian, I don't remember the words, but they said it's not very possible, even though they supported that the mission started. So it took us a little bit longer than two days to get to Strasbourg through the traffics on the roads and all others, but that doesn't matter. You know, when I saw an 11 hours debate in the Can Council of Europe, back then 47 member states, and in, in this uh, 11 hours passing by the debate uh, with the Russian flag being put down and we became 46 fully committed to uh, the resolution of this crisis of all in the 74 years, we're answering right now a very important question, how do we address the issues of international law? And I was, you, uh, 12 years ago, uh, being a student in uh, Kharkiv, my hometown in the east of Ukraine, and my university, my home university was bombarded numerously. Uh, my apartment was under the different types of rockets, and I'm becoming an expert in them. I can distinguish now in models and types, unfortunately. And this is a, these are the war crimes. Also, the war crime is a two-day born baby in Zaporizhia region, or a lady who was raped in front of her children, or a man who was suffering uh, a case of uh, very severe atrocities in front of him uh, by, uh, by killing all his family members. All this, dear colleagues, and I'm addressing you as professionals, are numerous, numerous war crimes, crimes of aggression, and uh, a, a uh, science of a genocide. This we put in a one big box. Back then, with the first resolution in March, we passed. We already said that the Russia has to be out of this international organization, Council of Europe. But most importantly, for the first time on the 13th of March, we mentioned uh, a um, suggestion to set up already ad hoc tribunal. So nine months ago, uh, His Excellency Ambassador texted me saying, Maria, insert it as a small amendment, let's try. And I'm not saying it in many meetings, but in front of you I should, because this is a motto of our nine months diplomacy, which is a brave diplomacy, a ripe diplomacy, and very straightforward diplomacy. We make impossible possible. Nine months ago, we didn't know we will be talking not only about the understanding that we have to fill the gap of accountability in the ICC, and I'm not giving a lecture here. You can read it in the books. Um, and uh, my mission is just to let you know that 
we are living. We were living a dream back then, and we are living a reality today when, um, as uh, His Excellency Ambassador mentioned, four resolutions passed in Council of Europe Parliamentary Assembly, two in Parliamentary Assembly of NATO, one in the OECE, uh, more in UN. Uh, there are many more which are coming at the national level. Just yesterday, the uh, Assemblée Nationale in Paris, after very heated debate, which we followed until 11 at night, yes, they work so long in the French Parliament, uh, the, uh, the uh, resolution was passed with vast majority. Uh, what we're trying to show here, and this question was addressed among the population, um, how, can we, uh, how can we make it clear that we are trying to set up a tribunal for one crime, a mother crime of all, which is a crime of aggression, which led, I can hear you speaking, guys, uh, which led to the, uh, which led to the, I know it might not be interesting, but important, I think, for the future of what you're studying today. Um, uh, and I'm lost because of lack of sleep. So uh, what we're trying to deliver today, this tribunal will be eventually set up with a very broad international support. And we, by bridging the gap, are very uh, blunt saying that ICC doesn't have a mandate just because nor Russia and I, the Ukraine ratified Rome Statute, even though we would want to do so, and we have a, uh, a will to do so, uh, Russia wouldn't. Therefore, let's stop this discussion. Let's stop going in rounds of this, and I'm sorry for not being diplomatic, lame argument that we still have to stick to this idea. Strengthening ICC, that's what we have to do. And this is bridging the gap of accountability. This gives us an opportunity to look at the ad hoc tribunal with the Rome Statute as main ideas. Here we talk about trial in absentia. Maybe we will not see Putin and his closest counterparts in a possible court in The Hague or whatever that will be. We are very uh, close to setting up interim prosecutor's office that will start for us a very important role of um, uh, this mechanism to follow. And of course, uh, this is international justice. And colleagues, this is not just the justice for Ukrainians. Uh, of course, this is justice for Germany in every member state who would join. And we're here talking also about the global south. Maybe the Council of Europe would be a great solution, but it's only 46 member states. And um, now Iceland uh, is holding a presidency for the, sec for the next six years. And they're taking it very seriously to have it priority in their agenda. We will see how it goes. But the signals, and I'm finishing, I think I'm overdue with the time. The signals are very clear and very positive right now from what we've started with back in March, what we've been hearing even two weeks ago in Berlin, Paris, Brussels, and many other European capitals. We're hearing a clear signal, firstly, of a political support, and secondly, from Ministry of Foreign Affairs, and let's look closely in December meeting of the European Council, heads of states in Brussels, uh, who tasked uh, European Commission, uh, Commissioner Borrell, and as well as we've heard Madame von der Leyen already mentioned yesterday that they go ahead with this ad hoc tribunal backed by UN, that it will be set up. And I think all the countries and all the partners have to be on the right side of this history. And I address you, dear friends, where you can tweet, you can put it on social media with the special hashtag, uh, special tribunal or tribunal, whatever you would want to put. But your engagement is crucial. This is there has to be an engagement of society and, most importantly, students. Vielen uh, Dank, and uh, I, this is a real privilege to speak in front of you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for your speech. Um, uh, I'm very glad that we also have a representative from the Ukrainian civil society here with us, uh, Ms. Alexandra Drik. Uh, she is a lawyer and analyst with the Civil Liberties Center, which is a Ukrainian human rights organization. Uh, and this organization has been co-awarded the Nobel Peace Prize in 2022. Uh, Ms. Drik, we look forward very much to your speech. Thank you. Well. The funny thing that we haven't 
really physically received the award yet. It's going to happen only in 10 days, but ever since it was announced, I'm wherever I go, I'm expected to deliver a Nobel uh, Prize winner speech. But <laughs> it's uh, half past seven in the evening and you're still here. And I, I was told there is a football game uh, somewhere. <laughs> so I'm assuming that you are here because you are curious to get some answers to maybe some questions you might have uh, about Ukraine and this uh, ongoing Russian war in Ukraine. And I'm really looking forward to listen to some questions from you, to be honest. Uh, so I'll just give you some, some pieces, some bits of information that you might start thinking about and then we can develop this uh, discussion later in the Q&A session. So why we as civil society want this tribunal? In very simple words. First, because this war is, uh, has a genocidal nature. Uh, you know probably that there's a big difference on declaring uh, politically something a genocide and then proving it uh, in the court. But it doesn't matter at this point of time because we have been documenting crimes committed by the Russian army in Ukraine and based on the information of 27,000 of those crimes documented in nine months, I can tell you that it is a genocidal nature, meaning that Russians want us cease to exist. And it's hard, trust me. I've been documenting myself. It's, it's really hard to speak, to listen to the stories of these people whose uh, relatives, husbands, sons, wives were killed, tortured, raped, uh, deported, filtrated. That's difficult, very difficult. And then imagine that these people are actually going through this now as we speak, because this is what is exactly happening now in the occupied territories. Second uh, thing is that important to understand about this war is that Russia has been losing on the battlefield. The second most powerful army in the world is losing on the battlefield. That's true, because the Ukrainian army has been recently advancing in regaining the control over the territories previously occupied by Russia. And that's exactly why Russia has been terrorizing civilian population. Because this is what they do. Uh, they use the terror of civilian population as a means of warfare. They can't win uh, in a different way. Third thing. This is this war, we refer to this war and we see it as a neo-colonial war. It might sound different, uh, um, weird, I know, because neo-colonial is not something that we would normally think about when talking about Europe. But it has, it, it, it has deep roots uh, in the history between, the history of relations between Russia and Ukraine. And uh, Ukraine was previously colonized by Russian Empire. And we also believe that Ukraine was colonized uh, by Russia during the Soviet times the Soviet Union. Now, Russia wants to colonize us once again. Third, uh, the next thing is that this is not the first war. Russia is a uh, war of aggression and the place where Russia has been uh, committing war crimes and Russian affiliated troops. There was Georgia, there was Moldova, there was Chechnya, there was Mali, Libya, Syria. So you have many places where Russia has been conducting war crimes. But it has, go, it has been going unpunished for decades. And this is where we end up. We have the largest conflict after the second in, on the European continent, after the Second World War, and nobody can do anything. There is no institution that can hold uh, uh, Putin and, and, and his uh, allies uh, accountable for the crime of aggression. Is that something that we really believe we can preserve the rules-based international order that was one time uh, signed uh, and 
supported by 193 countries in the UN Charter? I don't think so. If there is no punishment for the aggression that Russia has committed against Ukraine, it means the end of the world as we know it now. And I'm not sure that what comes next will actually be safe. Because it would mean that every dictator in the world will understand that he can easily invade a neighboring country, annex some territories, and there will be no punishment for that. This is going to be a mess. And there will be much more crimes. This is why we believe this is extremely important. But another thing, and I keep saying this every time on every meeting and every speech that I have, we all need to understand that the victims of this Russian aggression against Ukraine are not limited to the borders of Ukraine. And it's not me, it's the United Nations that has calculated that 1.6 billion of people in 94 countries have been directly affected by the factors triggered by the Russian aggression against Ukraine. They refer to this as a cost of living crisis. And it consists of three dimensions, food insecurity, financial crisis, and energy crisis. I repeat, 1.6 billion people in the world have directly felt the consequences of Russian invasion of Ukraine. And Russia continues to do that. What it means is that Russia has already caused so much suffering to the people that we have been documenting in Ukraine. But it also continues to make so many people suffer around the world. The victims of this Russian aggression against Ukraine are scattered across the continents. And it will take a world to fix this. And there can be no peace without accountability. And this is why we support the establishment of the, crime, uh, of the Tribunal on the Crime of Aggression. And I'm looking forward to your questions. Thank you so much, uh, Ms. Rieck. This brings us to our last speaker before the question and answer session. Um, it's my great pleasure to introduce to you Christian Tomoschat, who is an emeritus professor of international law at Humboldt University Berlin, and among many other functions he has held, also a former member of the United Nations International Law Commission. Professor Tomoschat, uh, we look forward to your comment from a public international law perspective. Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, dear friends and colleagues, it's my task uh, tonight to give you a, a few aspects of the plan to establish an international criminal tribunal for the aggression of the Russian Federation against Ukraine. This is viewed by many as a panacea for that purpose to stop Russian aggression. But it is true that a great majority of the international community does support Ukraine. Unfortunately, there is no unanimity. We are very close to unanimity, but unanimity has not been reached at the United Nations. That's a big problem. Um, and it has been underlined already by the previous speakers why prosecution of aggression is so important under the present circumstances. You all know that individual perpetrators could be prosecuted by domestic tribunals in all countries of the world because there is universal jurisdiction for, in particular, for war crimes. And, uh, even ordinary soldiers who kill other people could be prosecuted if they cross into another country. But the difficulties that would be entailed by such an attempt to prosecute uh, people for individual crimes are enormous. And uh, 
the prosecuting authorities normally shy away from taking up such an enormous task. And therefore, it's so important to really to hit at the core of the crime, namely aggression, which the previous speakers had, have called the mother of all crimes. And it is true that genocide and war crimes are the result of the first act, namely aggression, which has opened the field for the commission of, of many other uh, crimes of, of great importance, which have well caused uh, death and destruction everywhere in Ukraine. Now, um, under the prevailing circumstances, unfortunately, we must admit that the creation of uh, such a tribunal will more or less be, remain, for the time being, a, a symbolic act. Uh, the members of the Russian government that could be charged with the crime of aggression all live in Russia, mostly in Moscow, and they are not unlikely to be surrendered to any prosecuting authority in uh, another country or before any other international institution. Therefore, the best way at the present juncture, in my way, in its defense against the aggression, is to provide it with effective weapons. I, I say so very clearly. And only weapons, but not other goods for the survival of the population. This message is also a message directed to the German federal government. It's not only uh, a message to the world at large, but in particular also to the German government to do to concrete acts to support the Ukrainians in their defense against uh, the aggression. I'm not talking about the concept of aggression. I did have that in my text, but, but we don't have to elaborate on, on that. I th think it seems very clear that what Russia has done and is doing is aggression, is the use of armed force against the territorial integrity and the sovereignty and the right of self-determination of another state and, and nation. No doubt about that. Um, you know that ag aggression can only be committed by states, never by single individuals, that's very clear. But the relevant hostile acts obviously committed by the members of the security forces of the entity in the background, mostly military personnel. At the legal level, responsibility in the internet, in the interstate relationship or, or responsibility under international law is entailed by any act of aggression. Such responsibility entails an obligation to make reparation, to make good the harm caused. On the other hand, criminal responsibility under international law exists only for individuals, not for states. There are no criminal states. You can say it in political terminology. This is a criminal state. This has been said many times that Germany, Nazi Germany, was a criminal state. That was certainly true in political terms. But uh, under the current legal structure of international law, uh, it is only individuals that can be prosecuted for the a criminal act of uh, aggression. Well, who, who then are the persons that may be liable to be prosecuted for committing the crime of uh, aggression? In the uh, Rome Statute, a definition has been given, and it says that persons may be prosecuted if the evidence is available. A person in a position effectively to exercise control over or to direct the political or military action of a state of an act of aggression which by its character, gravity, and scale constitutes a manifest violation of the Charter of the United Nations. 
This is a definition which differs to some extent from the definition given in the Nuremberg uh, Statute and the jurisprudence of the Nuremberg Tribunal, but it is clear that what we have to deal with today is uh, activities which fall under this definition given in the Rome Statute, no doubt about it. Um, uh, it is clear that the drafters did not wish to extend criminal responsibility to everyone in the, um, in the aggressor state concerned with the activities, uh, not even every member of the armed forces. An ordinary soldier cannot be charged with a crime of aggression if he's not in that special position which I just have li lined out. The concept pursued with regard to the crimes of the Nazi regime is still valid today. Prosecution only of those who played a leading role in the aggressive wars were to be targeted. In the present configuration, the same is true. A future special tribunal would not be set up as a kind of indictment against the entire Russian people or its entire army but should clarify the responsibility of the leading criminal clique. Now, what about the mechanisms? Uh, what mechanisms are available? It has already been uh, pointed to the mechanisms that are available, and the goal is now to establish that uh, international special tribunal. Um, well, that's a, the, the, the big question, and, and uh, we encounter here a structural weakness of uh, international law. Since 1945, international law has developed a rich body of uh, binding legal norms. But the question who can enforce these norms remains open to a large extent. In particular, the rules of the highest rank in international law are not self-executing. There is no automatic linkage between the bindingness of an international rule and its effective enforcement. Two months ago, the Ukrainian president, Zelensky, said in one of his speeches, it seems that he had, had, gives a speech almost every week, <laughs> every day. He, but he said, we still do not have an institutional basis to hold the Russian political and military leadership accountable for the crime of aggression. This is still true today. E essentially, uh, this brings us to a basic fact that the world order is still made up of sovereign individual states. No world government has come into being. Only some institutions have been endowed with power that extend to the ex entire globe, in particular the UN Security Council and the UN General Assembly. Now, the possible mechanism, what, what, is, what is conceivable? Uh, and uh, the first idea that came, comes to mind is to entrust the International Criminal Court with the task of prosecuting the members of the guiding elite in Moscow. It seems self-evident that this new world court should assume this task. It was then created in 1998, which most of you know, by virtue of a multilateral treaty, which states are free to accept or not to accept. Its task is to enforce the body of internal criminal law um, to the extent that national judicial bodies are either unwilling or unable to do that. Yet the Russian Federation is one of the 70 states that have not ratified the Rome Statute. It is therefore not bound by the statute. It is not by accident that it has refused to join the group of states supporting the International Criminal Court. As a matter of principle, uh, the Russian Federation dislikes, dislikes, frankly, being subjected to the authority of an international judicial body. However, one must note that the United States and China are in the same position, and to some extent also Ukraine. It must be added, however, that the International Criminal Court is not confined to applying only nationals 
of state parties uh, in, in the case of aggression. The Security Council can transfer to it any situation for the purpose of prosecution. Such a resolution of the Security Council requires a majority of at least nine of the 15 members of the uh, Security Council. However, every permanent member of the Security Council has a veto right to block any substantive decision. Committing a situation to the jurisdiction of the court is such a substantive decision. Russia has therefore the faculty to block its adoption. The discretion concerning the use or non-use of that blocking power has no clear legal limits. Some authors have added the idea that, uh, I was one of them a few months ago, that the use of the veto power could constitute an abuse and therefore an invalid act. Indeed, at first glance, it may appear scandalous that a state should be able to, to prevent any effort to hold it to account. This is a natural reaction of the observer flowing from a deep feeling of natural justice. However, the practice of the Security Council since its establishment in 1945 it show that states have often relied on the veto power in their own interest. Such actions have never been challenged as invalid, and there's no international judicial body that could hear such kind of complaint. Ukraine, although not a state party, the Rome Statute has made a declaration to the effect that it authorizes the prosecution of uh, crimes uh, committed on its territory, not only by foreign forces, but also by its own military forces. Such a declaration is explicitly permitted by the, the Rome Statute. But the statute provides at the same time that in the case of aggression, no trial may be started against an alleged offender if their state of nationality is not a state party of the Rome Statute. That's a States that have drafted the Rome Statute have accorded a tremendous privilege to the powerful states that reject any judicial control of their conduct. One may speak here of selective, positive, or negative discretion, whatever you prefer. The UN Security Council is endowed with the power to establish a second point to establish an international criminal tribunal on court with a view to ensuring international peace and security. It was already mentioned that it has done so twice at least in the case of Yugoslavia and uh, uh, the case of Rwanda. And it is clear that Russia would never accept the establishment. Of that. Okay, okay. <laughs> okay, it's nice that we're here, but... but uh, <laughs> well... Um, then uh, the General Assembly has no power to do so. It has no coercive power. Next point. Um, <laughs> because we, uh, yeah, I'm put under pressure here. Uh, very unfairly, of course. <laughs> uh, but individual states might establish uh, among themselves an, uh, a tribunal. Every state has a treaty making power. And, and uh, Ukraine has jurisdiction over crimes committed on its territory, and uh, they could establish such, but such a tribunal would, of course, need some support by the United Nations, particularly by the General Assembly, by a resolution. It is not clear whether such a resolution uh, could be achieved. And uh, then universal... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> My and, and next point, it, it remains true that treaties concluded between states are unable to impose duties on third states. And uh, Rus Russia would obviously invoke that uh, rule of general international law. And, uh, uh, well, uh, I come to the problem of immunity, which, which is, of course, a major problem. Uh, according to a customary rule of international law, heads of state and other people in leading positions like uh, 
ministers of foreign affairs in joy in unity. And um, um, it is clear that the treaty as a Security Council has provided in the statutes of the Rwanda Tribunal and the Yugoslavia Tribunal that uh, nobody can uh, uh, base, uh, base its defense on, uh, on uh, immunity. But the Security Council has an uh, overreaching uh, power, which a treaty between states does not have. This cannot be set aside by a treaty concluded between several states. Um, now, I come to the end. Do not point out all the uh, points uh, that were listed by me. And a, a last observation, which is a, an observation in, in the line of uh, legal policy in an effort to overcome the legal obstacle just set out in maybe permitted to make reference to the defeated Germany of 1945, where the need for punishment was felt so urgently by the entire international community that the drafters of the statute of the military tribunal in Nuremberg had to find new paths to fulfill the demands of natural justice. Although international legal norms to punish crimes against the peace did not exist, they included them in the list of punishable crimes, and the Nuremberg charters followed the draft, opining that the mountain of death and destruction left behind by the leaders of Nazi Germany was so tremendous that punishment was an absolute necessity under the fundamental principles of law and justice. Here, the situation is similar. The Russian Federation has launched a war against a nation that live in peace, causing tremendous harm to a foreign nation and its citizens. The number of human victims uh, is increasing every day. It was already said this uh, uh, in preceding minutes. And the, the cold caused by the arbitrary shelling of human dwellings and the vital infrastructure also brings about suffering and death in huge numbers. Is this now an opportunity to go forward as the military judges did in Nuremberg by making punishable serious violations of international law, punishable as a crime, inevitably. One feels inspired to try again such a historic leap ahead. However, caution is necessary. At the end of World War II, Nazi Germany was totally isolated. Um, uh, it had lost all of its allies, um, and there was no sympathy for, for Germany. Russia's army perpetrates the most horrible claims on a daily basis, yet, strangely enough, strangely enough, it still has numerous supporters, even beyond the small group of states governed by the ruthless dictators. Thus, the historical context is different. Notwithstanding its massive breaches of the law of peace under the Charter, Russia continues to enjoy sympathies, although visibly it has left the circle of Nation civilisée. It has lost the quality of nation civilisée, which constitutes the foundation of the international legal order. This is a disturbing finding. If there is no high rule of legitimacy that requires the punishment of political leaders who have breached the fundamental norms of the international community in such an impudent way, all the circumstances suggest that the historic step made by the Nuremberg Court should serve as a guideline for a new such historic job. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Tomoshat, for this uh, presentation. Uh, we are a little bit over time. We also started a bit late, but we should have at least one round of questions from, from the audience. And the briefer you ask your questions, the more we can collect. So I suggest that we collect four to five brief questions. 
please introduce yourself briefly, who you are, and then ask a question, maybe not a comment, really a question, uh, and then we collect them and have a final round on the podium. Please wait for microphones to be shown around. Um, there's a first question over here. And I collect two, three, four, yeah. Good evening, can you hear me? Uh, hi, thank you very much for very uh, interesting presentations. Uh, I'm PhD researcher at Viadrina University here, but I'm originally from Georgia. So I want to express my full solidarity to your fight against our shared com common enemy. Uh, as for the tribunal, um, of course we would like to, we want to see full support to the tribunal from international society, although I was wondering whether uh, some states have concerns or reservations to support the tribunal because it might set a precedent, especially probably po powerful states, it might set a precedent, precedent of establishing such tribunal for ad hoc situations in the future against these states as well. Uh, this is first and second very small. One, one question, please, uh, so we can collect five. Thank you. So we have um, another, the next question there, then Felix Lange. Um, and then I saw um, you here in the center and another one will also follow, please. Hello, good evening. Thank you for this uh, excellent uh, panel discussion. I'm Annegret Hartig. I um, will publish my PhD thesis on the domestic implementation of the crime of aggression in a couple of months. So I'm extremely interested in this topic too. And um, I really hope that um, you will succeed in establishing a special tribunal. But my question would be, what would you do if you fail to establish a spe special tribunal? Or put differently, would you consider domestic prosecutions of aggressors? And has this been used in international negotiations to convince other states to establish a special tribunal? Thank you. So Felix Lange next, and then... I, I have a question regarding an alternative route to the special tribunal, uh, the amendment of the ICC statute. You need a two-thirds majority of the state parties, and uh, it might be that you have the support uh, at this political moment for, for such a step. Uh, why, why don't you follow this, uh, this route? Okay, thank you so much. We have another question from one of our students here. Yeah, um, well, so... From me, also from me, uh, thank you for that really interesting presentation, and I hope, um, as well as everyone else, that you succeed in establishing a tribunal like that. My question would be: um, there are reports from Luhansk and Donetsk that uh, children get deported, or should I say, kidnapped? Um, would that also be considered in that tribunal um, and, and not on, on any, any other way to, to judge it? Um, because it didn't happen as, as, a, as a crime by the soldier, committed by the soldiers directly, but more or less an implemented force. If you don't leave, something might happen because um, some... Some people in the public say, well, they, they did it on their own free will, which is highly doubtful because um, if there are armed um, guards or whatever you want to call them, um, if they're there, there is noth nothing such like, like a free will for the public. Thank you. And I think we have one last question by Mr. Nadim um, over there. Hello, uh, thank you very much for the amazing presentation. I'm a, prof I'm a student at, from Professor Aust. Uh, my question would be, uh, although I would uh, love, of course, for the tribunal to be a success, um, a problem I see is a practical one. I think that, from my understanding, maybe it's too small, maybe, but I think that um, Russia would have to cooperate in any sort of way for this tribunal to have any success. Um, and I think, from how I see it, this would only be possible if uh, the Russian government would change. And I think if that happened, the um, then the the conflict would then de-escalate automatically, so then we would not need that tribunal. So my question would be, how will that um, problem be overcome that probably Russia would not want to cooperate in such a tribunal? Thank you very much. Thank you so much. So I suggest we have a round of answers also again in the order of presentations. Feel free to pick any question you would like to address. Um, the floor is yeah. yeah, so. Yeah. So. Switched on, sorry. I think no. that we can do yeah. that. Yeah. Yes, thank you. So, 
Professor. Uh, thank you for your questions, colleagues. Of course, uh, they are really wonderful ones. Uh, thank you for, for support. Uh, we are also uh, always with Georgia, and of course, this is, this is more than just uh, cooperation. This is friendship and uh, something more. Uh, concerning the issue of setting a precedent for big guys uh, for ad hoc situations in future, I think that we lawyers can frame it in such a way that it will not be uh, a threat for big, uh, powerful states. In particular, one of the reasons uh, may be the very specific situation in the sense that the act of aggression is recognized by the UN General Assembly. I think that this uh, disables some, I don't know, let's say states go and try to do the same. Um, and I think that uh, we, we of course know this concern uh, because we, we cooperate with, with our partners. Um, I think that we can frame it in such a way that this is only an ad hoc thing only for us, uh, for this particular situation, and it doesn't go deeper. Um, very good question uh, from a colleague who, who uh, works on the matter of the crime of aggression. What will we do if we fail? Well, frankly speaking, uh, there is this idea in at least my mind that we cannot fail. So it's like, you know, it's a one-way road and you cannot imagine that this isn't done. Um, not only because, I mean, your professional ideas, career, whatever, it doesn't matter at all. Uh, but it will be a tragedy for my people um, to see that, I mean, nothing happens at all. Um, so I think that we will not fail. And I think that um, with, with being open to discussions and discovering of options, I'm sure that we may find the option which will bring justice to this particular situation. It's not an easy stuff, of course, um, but we need to do that. And I think that moving in that direction, since we, we have these time limitations today, we, we think that some steps may be taken before the tribunal itself is established. And Maria was, was talking about that briefly, interim prosecutor's office, uh, placing uh, a small team of Ukrainian prosecutors somewhere in Europe for them to investigate the crime of aggression against Ukraine on the basis of Ukrainian national jurisdiction, on the basis of Ukrainian criminal code, but in relation to the leadership of the Russian Federation. Uh, we believe that this is already a value, and this may be done if our partners support this rather fast. I mean, for us, it's just making a decision that somebody tomorrow will come to some place in Europe. Uh, so we do think that this may be done, you know, uh, step by step. Um, concerning the question concerning the amendments to the ICC statute, I think I mentioned this as as a lawyer. I I, I like this idea, but seeing the history of how Kampala amendments were adopted and how many states adopted them, and understanding the position of uh, states, which are some states or a lot of states, which are members to the Rome Statute, that they will not do that will they will not ratify Kampala amendments in the nearest future. So I think in general for international law, it would be very good if the Rome statute is, amend, uh, is amended and, and, the crime of, and the jurisdiction of the crime of aggression is the same as for other three core crimes. But uh, for us, it will, it will not work. So uh, again, our idea to establish a special tribunal is not to, is not to make something alternative to the ICC is just to, to have a response to, to this particular situation, which cannot be neglected. Uh, concerning the question of deportation of children, uh, yes, this is a big matter. This may be qualified as an act of genocide, alleged, or as a crime against humanity. Uh, I'm sure that the competent authorities will find the, the way. So, and, and I think that both in current uh, established international mechanisms and Ukrainian national prosecutors are looking very closely to this issue, uh, especially taking into account that a lot of data is available online. Say, the person who is responsible for the issue of children uh, in Russia adopts, I don't want to say this word, uh, Ukrainian boy, because this is not adoption, this is kidnapping. 
And this is this part of this big deportation for politics. So I think that, of, uh, I think, frankly speaking, ICC will take this. Uh, my personal, like, uh, position on this matter, and I, and I think that Ukrainian prosecutors will also. And the point on the practical problem, Russia will not cooperate. Okay. Russia doesn't co cooperate with pretty much all the world. Um, but if the tribunal is legitimate and credible, if it is supported by regional powers, by the United Nations, um, it may be it may be really a big thing, and I think that, practically speaking, uh, it may be a big b game changer, because the one thing is that I'm sitting here and talking with you, and I say, Putin and Lavrov are criminals. Uh, this is a political perception and position. But whenever there is an indictment, or arrest warrant, or the starting or the investigation started, this is the other story. And I mean, you know, in Russia, some things historically changed. Uh, maybe this might be the game changer. So I, I don't want us to think that Russia's not cooperation shall impede or hamper our, our efforts and our work. I thank you. Thank you, Ambassador. You have practically answered all questions, so you can just... No, no, you can, you can just... Can say, I can say, friends, we have, we have, we have to start the buffet. The best situations... <laughs> You're in if the best I may, situation. no, of course you may. You can just pick and choose and answer whatever. 30 you Sekunden, uh, yeah, 30 Sekunden. No, uh, cut you short. Don't worry. Friends, this is very interesting because we are hearing questions with regards to ch missing children, deported children at every meeting. And thank you for this important question. I, I'm, I'm addressing directly children, not undermining other questions, which were also brilliant. But we have figures from ombudsman, uh, from uh, ombudsman of the Ukrainian parliament working directly with human rights, and he called it a war against human rights. So just um, uh, the, the uh, figures which we are having is 6,700 plus cases registered with the National Police of missing children. But we estimate that the uh, missing and relocated forcibly children are amounting to around 300,000, unofficial number. 300,000, unofficial number. Please don't quote it as official figure. Moreover, since the 24th of February, we were witnessing from 2014 uh, internal displaced person persons who were forced to uh, uh, relocate to Russia, uh, Belarus, elsewhere. Now the figure is enormous. It's up to 2 million people forcibly displaced, and there can be infiltration camps, including children. They can be forcibly passportized, including children. But even worse, what we are experiencing is children from 4 to 18 years who are forced to be taught at the temporary occupied territories by Russia, taught uh, the sort of young army uh, of Russia uh, theories and, and pr practical, um, uh, I don't know, exercises, etc. So you can imagine a six-year-old boy receiving the sick, sick ideology, and then they are recruiting underaged to the army, which is absolutely illegal. Well, we can talk about these cases forever. I just, I just thought. Mm, uh, Narin, if I'm, yeah, I got it right, super. Narin, I think I took your question a little bit in a different way. So definitely Russia has never cooperated and, and this is a notion of um, uh, Professor Christian saying that there are, there are, um, uh, they are not uh, very, they, uh, Russia dislikes to be a responsible part in international society. I'm citing the professor, indeed, however, we don't need them to cooperate right now. We tried three times, three trips in March to Minsk for conducting negotiations. They didn't lead to anything. Members of parliament were part of this trip. It was a very uh, challenging one. Uh, uh, but what I wanted to ask that the, um, uh, uh, the, the cooperation with the future uh, possible a changed government. Yes, I've met today in the Bundestag a young gentleman who worked for Mr. Uh, Nemtsov, God bless, bless his soul. Yeah, I remember that day uh, when he was killed in front of Kremlin. And uh, I think it was the only person who could chair Russia so that the region would have never witnessed those wars in uh, Georgia, in uh, Ukraine, and who knows elsewhere. Therefore, we come back to the idea of tribunal as a signal for no impunity which should take place. And this is our message. And Didi Madlova for your question. This is the only word I know in Georgian. <laughs> Thank you, friends.
Okay, we together with the professor, we are the ones announcing the buffet. <laughs> Oh. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Before before you leave, uh, let me let me thank everyone on the panel for for making the journey to Berlin. Um, it's a great it's a great pleasure to have hosted you here. A privilege. We wish you all the best for your continued efforts on this difficult path. Uh, we now have a reception which is sponsored by the Konrad Adenauer Foundation, and it's the reception upstairs. The party downstairs is a different event, so please go to the reception upstairs. Thank you so much, and we continue there. Thank you.